Michael Clam here in the Wangenheim Room at the San Diego Public Library for Conversations with Poets with Carla Cordero, the one and only. Looking forward to chatting to you about all things poetry here in San Diego and hearing a couple poems too, a little bit of inspiration. I uh, want to thank the Public Library for giving us these beautiful spaces to put on conversations with poets. Uh, shout out to Mark Cherry for all of the support of poetry and literacy in San Diego and Misty Jones as well. And Black is directing. Uh, mm -hmm. He's not in the room at the moment, but he's here in spirit. He's just a, just a text or a call away. And we love Anthony Blackshire as the publisher of the San Diego Poetry Annual and also uh, representing the San Diego Entertainment and Arts Guild. Uh, Got to thank uh, Sherwood. Wood Hartwell and Kent Tran, uh, editing and behind the cameras. Uh, thanks, boys. And uh, we want to uh, kind of start out just by saying hello and seeing how you're doing. How are things, yeah. Carla? It's going great, Michael. It's best one day at a time. One day at a time. Miss the pandemic. Right? Yeah. yeah. So what's new now that we're kind of coming back around? I mean, we're maskless right now, we're pretty close to each other. You know, yep. it feels like things are changing. Uh, so what's new for you? What's coming up? Um, I mean, as of now, uh, we're hitting summer, which is always nice. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a little bit of a sabbatical come in the fall, so that's going to give me plenty of time to just uh, go back to research and reading things I love and writing things that I've been, I've been called to do. Mm -hmm. So that's been real good. Growing lots of organic food in the backyard um, and then bringing that to the table for dinner, which is always really great. Mm -hmm. And then just doing a little bit of side teaching throughout the summer, uh, providing a lot of virtual poetry workshops and professional development for the community. Yeah, uh, I know you guys garden, right? Mm -hmm. I, I garden too. Uh, Beautiful. San Diego is a great place to be a gardener. Mm -hmm. uh, but you also, your teaching is through City College, so right yes. here, right? Just a, just a rock throw away, right? That's right. And yep. are you still, you're still teaching through City College, but you're going to go on sabbatical? Yes, yeah, so I got sabbatical um, as associate faculty at San Diego City College, but I will be teaching a creative writing class in the fall with mm -hmm. uh, Mira Costa College in the fall. Yeah. Great. Do you have a, uh, an approach, a philosophy of education? Mm -hmm. uh, what is your method to get people writing? Are you teaching creative writing? Yes, yeah. I am. So mm -hmm. if I'm not teaching virtually with my community creative writing, I'm definitely teaching or implementing creative writing, poetry, uh, literary narrative into curriculum, whether it be at Miracosta City mm -hmm. College. Uh, in terms of philosophy, I mean, it really depends on the dynamic of your classroom. But a lot of times it's thinking about how to get students to speak from the perspective of their own lives because there's a richness there. So instead of focusing on student deficits, how can we actually use their cultural capital to bring in the richness of their lives and their experiences and connect that back to the frameworks of theory, of literature, and then actually using student service learning where we can then put those, that, those pieces of knowledge into practice out in the community. Since we're amidst uh, a pandemic and transitioning back to kind of normality, uh, we're trying to find new ways to use student service learnings mm -hmm. and, and poetry. So that could be a virtual open mic, that could be writing poetry and haikus on postcards for our essential workers. So we're definitely finding really creative ways to get students excited and engaged in writing virtually, which has been fun to explore. I'm sure. Yes. Do you have a way, like a special way that you get students started? Because it seems like that's kind of the main thing, the big sure. hurdle to get over, just Absolutely. to simply sit down and get the words uh, organized and down on the page. So do you have something that you, that you do to get them to jump in? Well, if we're, if we're looking at virtual learning, that's <laughs> definitely going to be completely different than face-to-face yeah. -face in the classroom. But essentially, I mean, my job to kind of help students get excited about writing is to make sure that all the pieces of literature, the pieces of spoken word, uh, poems, are all reflective mirrors of their own realities. So literature, poetry, slam, spoken word can do a couple things. Mm -hmm. They could be mirrors, they could be welcome mats, they could be windows. And so when we provide that kind of access to our students to see that connectivity mm -hmm. in the stories that I offer them, then it gives them the opportunity to create a visibility for themselves through the language they want to tackle. Mm -hmm. So it's about creating safe space, uh, a welcoming space where they don't hide themselves behind abstraction, but mm -hmm. they're using metaphors to actually 
uh, enact the stories that they want to tell, the stories that they've never been given a platform to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, so, th you know, this is about just creating a space that welcomes them to do that kind of work. Yeah, we were talking to Jeff Walt uh, earlier today, mm -hmm. and he said that he gets up in the morning and the first thing he does, he doesn't pick up a pen, he mm -hmm. doesn't start typing, mm -hmm. the first thing he does is open a book. Mm -hmm. And he's got a daily ritual, and I think you're right, as people through maybe sociopoetics or telling mm -hmm. their own story or hearing others tell their story, right. then they'll jump into their own and feel comfort, that comfort in, yep. hey, other people are doing this. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, who are your inspirations? So like if you were, say if you were teaching, mm -hmm. uh, who, what slam poets would you have them uh, watch perform or what poets would you mm -hmm. have your students read? Ooh. Um. And, and it's going to be like a level of blasphemy here because <laughs> I, you know, I can go on forever and ever and ever. Um, I definitely break up my creative writing course into a series of units. So we're talking about the dynamics and complexity of family. Mm -hmm. There's definitely a list of poets there. If we're talking about uh, cultural integrity or food or um, social justice, then I always have like my go-to writers. Um, but I mean, my always favorites to showcase them. Um, are, we're just in reference to slam or spoken word. Yeah. Is that? Um, I love Rudy Francisco. Mm -hmm. I love saying that he is local mm -hmm. and that makes it a level of accessibility mm -hmm. or ac access to students if they want to go check out an open mic or a slam. Um, his, his use of language in very refreshing and surprising ways mm -hmm. is super captivating. So I think students tend to gravitate to that work a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I use, gosh, so much work. I use the work of Pages Matam, Alicia Wise, who's a powerhouse of a writer and knows how to call um, any room's attention to understanding um, the, the disparities and the hardships of what it means to be woman, mm -hmm. but how to reinstate power in those moments. Um, I love the work of Mercedes Holtry, who's from Albuquerque, uh, mm -hmm. New Mexico, and talks about what it means to be Chicana in, a, in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. um, and the list goes on and on. But I'm always looking for writers that can engage in a very contemporary way, mm -hmm. um, but archiving the complexities of their identity and the celebrations of themselves. Yeah. yeah. How do you feel about language poetry? Because I'm hearing mm -hmm. that you poets should be writing from their experience, mm -hmm. you know, true to their experience and the truth as they see it in the world that they've lived in sure. and feel like this is a way to get out what they're feeling, not only to get it out, but to kind of have a living history of what's going on mm -hmm. from the real people living in that real history. Absolutely. Uh, uh, what about uh, poetry that doesn't tell a story or language poetry mm -hmm. that's almost more device than uh, narrative? Right. I mean, when we think about language poetry, there's still thought from a human's perspective mm -hmm. to capture a moment, to capture a sentiment, a tone, a feeling, a memory, um, inspired from some kind of outside factor experience. So when we think about uh, you know, poetics and language, um, they're essentially still trying to tell a story. Are they going to be as accessible and as narrative, mm -hmm. as um, more prosaic? Poetry? Probably not, mm. but I think poetry also lends itself to be fragmented in, a, in the sense that asks the reader to slow down. And when we can slow down and interrogate and have intimate conversations with how language moves on the page, then it gives us the opportunity to slow our, our reading down, be more curious about how language is operating on the page, and really try to understand the voice of the speaker, which is always subjective, but that's kind of the fun part to kind of figure out how is this particular piece of painting hanging on the wall trying to communicate a message? And poetry and language can do the same kind of work, yeah, which read, is fun. Read, yeah, read, 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 right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, no, you, were, you grew up in Calexico, is that right? Yes. Where, where is Calexico? <laughs> okay, so for y'all that don't know Calexico, Calexico is actually a small little border town at the very tip end of California. It borders uh, Mexicali, Mexico. Yeah. And it is a small little agricultural town um, that is probably about two and a half hours from essentially San Diego. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how you are growing up in Calexico, how has that sort of, has it defined you as a writer? Do you mm -hmm. consider yourself, asked Olga Garcia this question, mm -hmm. if she considered herself a border poet. Right. And she, her answer was interesting. She talked about being a border poet mm -hmm. as a woman who's sure. living constantly, because she, when she went to university, she was the first woman in the, the um, department of physics, right? Mm -hmm. So she had, there were lots of lines 
for her to cross that people did sure. not want her to cross. So she talked about it almost as a metaphor. Mm -hmm. uh, do you consider yourself, do you ever call yourself a border poet? I've never called myself a border poet. I grew up by the border. But I mean, when we think about the isolation of the term border, we could think about border as a concept of tangible and abstraction. Mm -hmm. And these are the kinds of walls, whether we want it to be, you know, literal or invisible walls that all of us deal with uh, when it comes to our identities and how we fit in the world and how environment, space, politics play in the fitting and the belonging. Mm -hmm. And so growing up literally at the border, there's definitely an influence in landscape, language, culture, traditions that is going to inform the kinds of stories I want to tell. So um, a lot of the stories that I do tell in my poetry um, are, you know, kind of an ode or an honoring to my family, to my ancestors, to the histories of the landscape, and then making that slow transition to how does now the landscape of San Diego and the people of San Diego and the diversity and the population of San Diego play a role into that, yeah. um, you know, calling of story that needs to be told. Indeed. Uh, you brought a poem called uh, Ode to Tortillas. Yes, I did. <laughs> I'm so excited. Yes. So, uh, would you read that poem for us? Can I we, would we, love and to. And then tell us a little bit about the writer. Is this sure. some, someone who inspires you? Olivares, right? Yes. And uh, is this someone who is a mentor, mm -hmm. someone who inspires you? Do you know Olivares? Do you know much about? Uh, so I know Jose Olivares. Mm -hmm. He is a poet from Chicago, and I only know him from the um, from his book called uh, Citizen Illegal, which is a fantastic read. So if y'all haven't picked it up, pick it up. Um, but definitely his poems, um, there's a lot of connection there in terms of identity and what it means to be Chicano or Chicanex in the 21st century mm -hmm. and how family and capitalism and politics and finding self-love amongst that journey come all together in the end. So. Big fan of Jose's work, but I would love to read one of his poems. Um, so shall I go yeah, ahead and do you? that? Yeah, yes, I'd absolutely. Uh, so this poem of his uh, was actually published in The Atlantic, uh, March 21st of this year, 2021. It is titled Ode to Tortillas by Jose Olivares. And it starts, there's two ways to be a Mexican writer that we've discovered so far. You could be the Mexican writer who writes about tortillas, or you can be the Mexican writer who writes about croissants instead of tortillas on their plate. Can you be a Mexican writer if you're allergic to corn? There's two ways to be a Mexican writer that are true and tested. You can write about migration, or you can write about migration. Or can you write about migration? Can you be a Mexican writer if you never migrated? if your family never migrated. There's two ways to be a Mexican writer. You can translate from Spanish, or you can translate to Spanish, or you can refuse to translate altogether. There's only one wound in the Mexican writer's imagination, and it's the wound of the chancla. It's the wound of birria being sold out at the taco truck. It's the wound of too many dolores and not enough dollars. It can be argued that these are all chanclazos. Even death is a chanclazo. There's only one miracle gifted to Mexicans, and it is the miracle of never running out of cheap beer. It's the miracle of never running out of bad jokes. There's infinite ways to eat a tortilla, made in the ancient ways by hands and warmed on a comal, made with corn or with Taco Bell plastic. What about flour tortillas? Flour tortillas count if you ask San Antonio. My people, I am poly with the tortillas. Can you eat tortillas with your hands or roll them up and dip them into caldo like my mom does? Can you eat them with a fork and a knife like my bougie cousins do? What bougie cousins? I made them up for the purpose of this poem. You can eat tortillas and tacos or warmed up by microwave and drizzle with butter, tortillas con arroz, tortillas con frijoles, tortillas flipped by my hand or tortillas flipped with a spatula, tortillas with eggs for breakfast, tortillas fried and sprinkled with sugar for dessert, 
hard shell tortillas, gluten-free tortillas for our mixed family. We are still discovering new ways to fold a tortilla, to cut a tortilla up, to transform a tortilla into new worlds, to feed each other with tortillas. My people, if I have children, I will teach them about tortillas, but I'm sure they'll want McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Ode de Tortillas. <laughs> oh man, it ends on a, on, on a humorous note. Yep. Hey, tell me about the chanclazo, right? Is this sure. literally the chancla? Is this lessons from mom? Is this a, the right. chanclazo is a kind of, uh, kind of a lesson. You get the chancla sure. to learn something, right? Mm -hmm. to, uh, so tell me about the chanclazo. What, what does that mean for people who might not, not know? Sure, so obviously uh, the chancla, the infamous chancla is an iconic symbol that within Latinx, Chicanx culture, parents use to discipline their children. Mm -hmm. Now that might not be true for all folks, uh, but if someone is familiar with the chancla, it is kind of our mother's way to um, get us to kind of behave in the sense of like her removing her chancla and giving us, you know, like a yeah, subtle little tap to the bottom and yeah. say like, hey, get, get yourself mm -hmm. together. Yeah. Um, but the chancla is essentially, you know, if it's the wooden spoon yeah. or yeah. the wire hanger, yeah. or whatever that discipline may look like, Yikes. ours is the yeah. go-to chancla. Uh, I, was the, I grew up by the beach. My dad was in the Navy, so we were stationed mm -hmm. on Midway Island, so it was the flip-flop. <laughs> there you go, the flip-flop. I love it, yeah. <laughs> they fly like a boomerang, man. Yeah, they're perfect, <laughs> lightweight, but very impactful. <laughs> Yep. Um, so you uh, identify mm -hmm. also with your um, your ancestors, right? Mm -hmm. Northern Mexico, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, do you kind of in in your progression as an artist and as a writer, are you sort of bringing that along and trying to keep that history mm -hmm. alive? Is it is it purposefully mm -hmm. always part of the work that you do to keep sort of your ancestry alive? Sure, I mean, I think me being present and being in the space of speaking mm -hmm. uh, is always invoking the ancestors. Mm -hmm. uh, the wonderful poet Willy Perdomo says, I invoke the ancestors and will change the molecular structure of a room. Mm -hmm. So if I am here speaking, I am also here manifesting and also calling forth the ancestors mm -hmm. to use language as the way it needs to um, be told. Yeah. So. Uh, I have a few poems in my book that kind of create an ode to her um, mm -hmm. and who she is as a person. Mm -hmm. um, I also have a, a picture close by to her when I write a lot, or a close by to me when I'm writing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if, if there's a story that needs to be told and she needs to be part of it, then she definitely comes into the picture. Yeah, yeah. and so do you feel a presence of uh, Chichimeca? Is that right? Mm -hmm. Chichimeca That's it. Yep. is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, did you bring a poem to read today? I did bring a poem, All yes. Right. Will absolutely. you read it for us? I would love to. Okay. So uh, this is a new poem that was written uh, amidst the pandemic. And so it is titled, Gratitude to all things that resurrect aside from the Lord on Sunday. Somehow I was convinced resurrection was only for a man leaving a tomb. And perhaps I blame the Bible Perhaps I blame myself for overlooking God's synonyms for rising. So perhaps I forgive myself how I never thought to praise my own flesh, little machine of muscle that levitates her weight from the mattress to floor to Monday to days of madness testing my ability to stay a mountain. So let this moment be grace at the kitchen table to thank the bagel who blares the heat wave, toaster of sacrifice, a rise to crisp, only to witness its own burial, buried in cream cheese or avocado, or perhaps alongside huevo con weenies or scrambled egg, and oh Lord, let us praise the egg, you tiny bird death, never seeing the light of feather, whose purpose is called to rise, yoke into yellow textured volume, complemented with the iced coffee, coffee with its condensation feeding a cloud's belly, belly full of rain from the backyard garden and all that is growing. So let us praise the bean sprout in the raised bed. O oh, smallest of miracles, brave leaf who lifts its arms to the largest of burning stars. And dare I say it, let us praise the nipple who hugs the breeze and speaks through t-shirts like tiny roofs that house my heart. And shall I praise the holiest of risings, swollen womb, nine months growing in my sister's belly, birthing my niece. So praise my niece 
who runs like a tugboat at sea, who raises her knees to sail, breaking through every wild shrub, like this poem breaking through this very blank page, in her silence, like the black ink of language marching like ants home, together to see a tomorrow. So let us praise this page, you slow ending, you funeral I hate, yet take joy in its making, so I too can make space for the skeleton of words that will rise and show us how hope will speak again, again, and again. Hallelujah, I say, amen. Mm. Yeah. Your poems, do they come to you quickly? Mm -hmm. Do you have a process? Is this a poem that you wrote and sure. it just gushed out? Or was this a poem right. that you um, took some time uh, uh, editing down? Uh, well, for this particular poem, um, I, you know, well, we, when we got in the middle of the pandemic, mm. I was trying to think how to find hope amongst so much chaos in the world. And so as a writer, I naturally gravitate towards my bookshelf and who I should be reading. And so I was doing a lot of reading from author Ross Gay, who has a book about gratitude, uh, readings from poets like Araceles Girme, who talks and finds the beauties of the world, uh, reading poet Ada Limon, who appreciates the microcosms of the world. and so finding the smallest joys in the places we often take for granted. Mm -hmm. And so as, you know, I'm getting influenced by the various ways we can find gratitude and joy and create hope mm -hmm. through our images, uh, I began to create a catalog list of the smallest, silliest um, things in my everyday life that I can bring to the page and, and show a lot of gratitude towards. So um, it, it didn't like happen immediately, but it mm -hmm. was definitely this kind of time of making a catalog of things that I'm very grateful for. And are you sort of texting these to yourself? Are you writing them right. in a journal? Are you typing them in a, on, a, on a laptop? Like how, do, how does it work? Yeah. All of the above. All so of the above. Um, when I write, I'll write some ideas down. I have a notebook that follows me everywhere. Mm -hmm. And if that notebook's not with me, I'm definitely using uh, the voice recording app mm -hmm. on my phone and just kind of archiving and transcribing all of that information when I have an idea. I love post-it notes all over the house. I write inside poetry books. Mm. Uh, so I'm definitely just using whatever's accessible at the time to get it. I do the ideas same. Down. I have an alter ego on my phone, Bob Nugs. I say, text Bob Nugs, and I'll <laughs> talk to myself in the car. You know? I love it. Yeah, you know, when it comes, you get it down. Yep. Sometimes you let it go for a minute, and you're like, no, I didn't knock it. I'm not going to forget, but then invariably you do. Yeah. You know? Or those are the feelings you have to chase. You can't yeah. say, I'm going to wait till later to write it down, right. because then that energy yeah. that needs to happen in that moment isn't in the as, moment. yep. Isn't and it's, a, it's surprising too, it can be minutes and mm -hmm. it's not there anymore. And then you know at the I mean? end of the day, you get your pen to page and you're like, mm -hmm. what was that one line? What was yeah. that one thought that got me real excited? Right. And then it's gone or forever. Or even one word, you know, it, what word did I use? Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. definitely you get that energy and that excitement, write it down anywhere. I've done hand, napkins, mm -hmm. uh, tennis shoes, I mean, <laughs> you just want to Keep it. That's right. And save yeah. it for yourself. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. I've got stuff all over the place, you know. So I was cleaning the car one time, and I'm like, oh, what's this? I pulled it up. I'm like, hey, <laughs> that's great, you know. I love it. To get, something to get started with, you know. Yeah. Um, and then go back to those journals, yeah. Absolutely. Go back, you know. I think one of those things about, like, if you have a lifetime or enough time doing this, you know, you've got all those notes that you've taken. Exactly. And if you're ever in a moment of, oh, okay, where do I want to go today? Oh, mm -hmm. Get back to it. Go to your and notes. Find those little gems. Find a moment. There. That's and right. It'll take you there. Yeah, do it, right? And mm -hmm. do the work, yeah. Well, like I would say in the palm of your hand, right? You got yep. to, it's right there. You got to just sit down, get down and do it, right? Hey, you um, uh, have defined yourself as an artivist. Yes. Uh, what, um, uh, what do you mean by artivist? Sure. Well, um, so the term artivism or artivist is. Uh, a contemporary term that a lot of artists are using. Um, again, everybody has their own definition, but for me personally, it's kind of the hybridity of what art and activism do. Um, you know, when they kind of give birth to a, you know, a child of their own, and uh, that child is an artist, um, and the idea of like embracing artivism is, how can I use my art to engage with my community? So as artists, we have our obligation to our communities. And so when we begin to think about activism, I'm not necessarily 
you know, having the fist up and holding picket signs, but sometimes the calling for that activism is, can I write a poem that talks about a social justice issue that isn't being spoken about or is very limited or is very one-sided perspective? Our job as artists is to create possibility through imagination and at the same time render them true. Mm. So we can use our poetry in the sense of activism or artivism to create possibility to reinstate power for our people through the use of language and to reimagine and rewrite our histories mm -hmm. as the ways that we didn't get the opportunity to do so before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with everything that's gone on, you yep. know, the years of Trump and, uh, you know, uh, nationalism, all, everything that's happened in the United States and then the closures yep. and COVID, mm -hmm. now's the time to write for sure. Exactly. You know, there's, there's got to be, everybody's got so much inside, so much there that they're holding, you know. Right get that true experience out, you know, talk about what's happening in the world yep. from your perspective. Yeah. And then in the middle of a pandemic, if you mm -hmm. have all your open mics closed and all your art programs closed, mm -hmm. if you can post a poem that can speak to so many people yeah. and create that virtual community and connectiveness, mm -hmm. I mean, what better way to reach your community than through the work of the gifts of what you can offer in language? Indeed. Right. Carla, Carla Cordero, thank you yes. so much for coming and talking Absolutely. to us here in the library, talking to me, and, and uh, I'm just so honored to have you here. Thank uh, you. Uh, uh, you've got to take a class with Carla. It sounds like you were just a fantastic oh. teacher. I'm sitting, sitting here riveted listening Yay. to your voice Good. and everything you have to say. <laughs> uh, Carla's got a number of uh, great books out there, so please check out Carla Cordero's, yes. uh, Carla Cordero's work, uh, including How to Pull Apart the Earth, uh, which uh, has, has earned uh, high praise for complexity and beauty. Yeah, there you, go. you are tender and wonderful. And again, thank you so much for joining us for Michael, Conversations with Poets. Michael, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, everybody, so much for the invitation. Thank You're you. very welcome. All right. Thanks.